we can start. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm Andres Freund, and I'm talking about how uh, we propose to implement uh, the features necessary to build logical replication on Postgres in a non-hacky way. And yeah, and that's what we propose. So what we want to do first, uh, for, to make that easier, is to get, get, provide a neater way to get a, the changes uh, necessary to replicate uh, data in a logical way. And logical here means that we have the tuples in a way that they mean something. In contrast to when we do streaming replication or hot, hot standby in Postgres, that's sh sh just shipping bytes around. Nobody knows what they mean. So all change set extraction basically does is that one session perform or multiple sessions perform any form of DML. They insert, they update, they, they delete potentially at some point they truncate relations and that those actions, we want those actions and stream them to some other node and do something on that other node, whatever that is we want to do. And there are several use cases. The primary one, which is why I'm mostly doing this, is that we want to build a replication solution around it. But there are also quite a bit of use cases around auditing because if it's in the uh, not in the right ahead lock, which is Postgres consistency uh, method, uh, it's not a persistent datum in the normal relation, so uh, doesn't necessarily need to be logged. For now, yes. <coughs> I'm not saying we provide everything. The basis, and then there are obvious other use cases like you want to replicate ten different databases into one, and or you, you want to process that stream and analyze patterns in it, or you want to do uh, integrate it into uh, some caching proxy and invalidate the pages that are relevant. There are quite many <coughs> use cases. So the high-level architecture we chose to do this is that uh, in a normal, you have a normal Postgres backend that just as normally writes write a headlock, which is what Postgres uses for crash safety and for the streaming replication. And that's all there. And then we call a so-called output plugin that gets the data from the write a headlock and formats it in that way you want it for your specific use case. So if you want to uh, replace that part of old style Sony, you would produce SQL snippets. If you want to do it for a new style, you would provide uh, some array of the columns. And they're quite, or if you want to do another replication solution, you might want to send the tuples in a binary format because the text conversion is inefficient. There are countless ways. And then you, those auto plugins are rather easy to write. And I'll show how that works in a bit. And then you actually want to get the changes. So for some use cases, especially for debugging and development, it's very useful to get the changes as, as a table in SQL. So we have a set returning function that just gives you, OK, give me all changes since the last time I called this function, and then gives you a table-like stream of those changes. Or you can do use the valve sender that we use for streaming replication and say, oh, I want logical data instead of physical data. And it will give you that. And that has the advantage that it's an actually streamed protocol. So you never have to have more than one tuple in memory at the same time. So how uh, do we work with that logical replication? There are three high-level steps to manage all that, which is the first is you say, OK, I want to do logical replication. And if you do it uh, on the SQL level, you say init logical replication with some parameters, I'll show them. Or you can do it on the var sender level, and then it's a different command. And the most used then will be start logical replication, which then just starts streaming up the changes. If you use the SQL level, it will give you all the changes up to now. If you use the streaming format, it will just stream out changes until you say, oh, I don't want 
And if, you're, if you, your replica goes down and you remove it, you can say, OK, I don't need that replication anymore. So if we, unfortunately, that has went too wide, I thought. <laughs> OK. Um, so on an SQL level, you can do select star from any logical replication, give that replication stream a name, and give it an output plugin, and that output plugin will be responsible for formatting the output. And then it tells you, OK, I created a slot of that name, and it starts at that x lock position. Because we base it on the right ahead lock, and that's just the position from where we can stream data onwards. So let's see how we can get the changes. So let's suppose after we have done the init logical replication, we do a create table and insert two rows, one row containing a one and another one containing a five. And then we can do select star from start logical replication, the slot name, and, and we say, OK, we want all the changes up to now. Or we can just say, give me that all the changes up to some LSN if we don't want to get too many changes at once. And then we'll give you the data. So we have the first transaction from here, which is the create table. Create table doesn't insert any data itself. So it's a transaction that gets a begin, a commit, and no data. And the next one is, OK, another begin, and then two rows, and then a commit again. So it does not give you the uh, No. We can do that, but uh, it's very hard to do anything sensible with them. Again? <coughs> no, so we don't do DDL replication yet. There's uh, some one person here in here who has worked on it a bit, and there's another one who has worked on it a bit differently. And I think we are on a good way to get there, but we aren't there yet. <coughs> There will, at some point, we will have the event trigger uh, thing, and that will allow you to replicate DDL as well. <coughs> we are just not there yet. I'm presenting what we actually have yet. Oh, okay. That's so what you're saying is when you get there, you have DDL. I think that's already useful for quite a bit of certain things, because normally you will do the create table, uh, the create table, and then you will do the create table on all nodes, or you do the create table, insert the create table into the queue table. That will then be replicated because it's normal insert and then replicate, replicate uh, execute all that. So you have to execute the DDL in the yeah. server. But you can all replicate the SQL statement for doing that. But, yeah? Um, I, I have a question how it, it works with mix uh, DDL in uh, <coughs> the table and it, it works. No, uh, will it show? Yeah, uh, so do you want to see the auto table? We don't replicate DDL itself. It, that it will replicate the data how it is on disk. So it will be con uh, have the default value filled out. Yeah, that was my question. <laughs> okay. So, excuse me. Um, so we stream that, and now suppose we do an insert, and then we drop the table, which is actually an interesting case. But we, as we can see here, okay, we do the start logical replication again, and it will now stream the data even though the table isn't there anymore in present. Uh, you'll see a bit later why that is not that easy. So as you can see, uh, or not that well see, is that I now passed a parameter to the function here, height xids, which if you compare the statements before, the text contained uh, the xid. Now it doesn't anymore. Uh, that's just a generic way to pass information uh, parameters to output plugins. So but no. and now I remove the node again, because I don't need it anymore. So the same thing can be done in a streaming fashion using the replication protocol. And that's just, OK, our tool for that is, at the moment, PG receive elf log, which is possibly not the base name. But yeah. So you tell it which host to connect to, which slot to use and where to write the data out. We just write it to standard output here. 
and then you say, oh, we init and we start streaming, and then it starts streaming the data. And as you can see, in this case, we updated uh, the primary key, and the old primary key was in the ID at one, and then the new one is minus one. So it gives you the data to do that. So if you can see here, uh, we have we, when you created this, we had defined the name, and suppose we have you have several nodes to replicate to. All those will have a different state up to where they're replicated. So we need to keep track which data do we need to retain on the primary to be able to stream from that specific position. Yes. Yeah, it's exactly the handle, which is crest, uh, which is persistent across restart, of Postgres, and everything. So you, you define it, and that ensures that you have enough information to stream data from there on, and also has information like in which, which database are we currently streaming, which output plugin are we using, because if you can check, see that we only define the output plugin here, the test disk coding output plugin on the init. We don't do that on the start logical replication anymore, which you do multiple times normally, uh, because those that output plugin can change parameters of what's needed and stuff like that. That is what I want to do. It's not implemented yet. Ah. But the more, yeah. But we have that, that in a shared memory segment, so it's just theoretically trivial to implement. I just well, want to do the same for physical. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So uh, I referred frequently to output plugins, and that's what uh, people who will implement uh, implementing a new replication solution will have to write because. They want to have their own output format. So currently, you have to compile a shared object. And that shared object has to define five callbacks. And they are pretty straightforward from the definition. We have one init callback that just says, OK, you can allocate memory. Those are the parameters passed to you. You're working on that database and whatever you want to do. And then whenever somebody calls, it, uh, when a transaction is streamed out, the begin of a transaction is streamed out, Called begin transaction and a change comes in, change and commit and cleanup is just if the replication stream goes down, you call cleanup. So here's the example callback from that aforementioned uh, test output plugin. So it gets uh, passed the context, it gets passed uh, information about the transaction, and it gets passed the information where we committed. So we do some scaffolding, and then we do the important part is we say, OK, we want, may want to write out the data. Say, OK, allocate enough data to stream out changes. Then we can pa check some options, which we earlier passed. OK, you want to write XIDs or not. And then you can just use the string info inf uh, infrastructure for writing out data. You can write out data, uh, binary data as well. You just need to use a different append string info. Uh, function. So in, a, in one case, we write out the commit with the XID and the one not. Obviously, that's you can also write out the timestamp and similar things. And then if we are really intra are interesting, we can write uh, out the data real, for real. And that will then go out and write the data necessary for either the SQL function to receive it or for the VAS sender to receive it or if somebody wanted to implement another method of receiving those changes, you could do that as, uh, in two functions. So the probably more interesting case is where we actually have a change. So again, similar thing. We get the context, the transaction. We get also now the relation in which the change was performed. And we get information about the change. So again, we do the trick with prepare write, which is unfortunately necessary. And then we do uh, a switch, which uh, says, OK, which action was the change doing? We have an insert, we have an update, or a delete. The, those are all the cases we currently have. Yes. Yeah? 
PLOC, the Postgres internal uh, code, you just throw an error that will stick jump upwards and you just use the normal Postgres code for error handling. So no, though, you would, uh, if you want to implement a new replication solution or you want to do auditing in a specific format and nobody has written the things for your format, you would provide these three, uh, these callback. So, or you just use an auto plugin which somebody else has written. There exists one, uh, two already, but those might not suit your needs because if you look back, the format here isn't really useful for anything except demonstration because I don't think you can easily parse that and use it for anything. So, you, for some other solution you want to do, create SQL there, whatever. So, yeah. So, and in, for example, what you can do in those, in, if you get an insert, is this. Okay, we got an insert, then just write the tag insert and then convert the tuple we get. We get a normal tuple, how it's used in Postgres. So we can call completely normal Postgres functions like, that won't tell too many of you, it is output fu uh, hand functions. We can, you can do anything with it. So I wrote a function, convert a tuple to a string info because there's some ugly things involved that aren't interesting and will scare most of you away, so <laughs> I don't show them. But uh, yeah, and that will stream the format the data. So okay, we had. Does that in any way handle uh, or filter out not updated columns? Uh, only at the moment, you get all columns passed except uh, unchanged toast uh, columns. They are uh, because. We, can, we could pass them as well, but it would, inc would increase the write volume and we don't need it at the moment. We can make it an option. Well, it would increase the write volume on the, on the replica, of course, with this and both. Oh, on both sides, actually. Yeah. Uh, so, and there's another problem. If you in initiate a replication stream, like uh, we did here, uh, you get all the changes from that position onwards, but how do you create a second database that has all the contents of that up to that point? Because you, if you do a normal PG dump, you don't have necessarily a consistent state because the changes might start earlier, they might stay later. So what do you do if you start, do the inner logical replication on the lower level, just uh, what you would normally would do from code, you connect to the database, say, okay, we're connecting via the replication protocol and do the init local replication thingy. It will give you, okay, from where are we starting, but it also gives you a snapshot name. So in a separate session, you can do bin, bin transaction and then you can do set transaction snapshot, that snapshot, and from that point on, you see exactly the state you had from where after which you would get all the changes from my slot. So, the init wait for a point in time where you are, where it's possible to stream all changes henceforth. And here, if we had a parameter dash dash snapshot for PD dump, we could actually <laughs> <laughs> stream changes from that point onwards. Or you can just start a copy, or, and you can do the same thing in multiple backends. So you could start. 10 backends all do the copy of the relations defined and then you can load them on the other side and afterwards you can do a start logical replication from that slot and will stream all the necessary changes. So now uh, that's what from the actual perspective of somebody implementing a replication solution is interesting. So if somebody has questions from what that all is useful for, go ahead. Yes. Well, it's, it, no, this, if you do the inner logical replication, as soon as you send the next command over that uh, replication connection, or if you end the replication connection, you can't import it anymore. Because the way the exportable snapshots work in Postgres is that the source uh, connection or transaction session, whatever, needs to be alive. So 
you need to for to wait till you did this to end the send the next command or disconnect. Mm, no. <laughs> you would you mean how do we release in that session the snapshot? Thing? That's independent. As soon as you start it, it's independent from the source transaction where you imported it from, and just the normal begin commit. Yes, a uh, commit rollback. Yeah, the snapshot name is stored in the backup. It's stored in a file, but it's opaque to you. You don't know anything about it. I'm not sure I can follow right now. Well, if you, if you, uh, if you want to uh, get the snapshot name, you actually create the, the, uh, data, uh, the database backup file, basically. You know the snapshot name from the replication table. Yeah, the ref if you start the logical replication, it will give you the name for that. And then you can start a modified PD dump or whatever code you want to do to copy the database on that. You don't need. I'm not sure what you mean by querying the database in that case. Well, my assumption was that you, you do the backup, and then you create stop execution. No, the point is that when you start replication, it needs to find a point in time where it has enough information to uh, decode changes from that point onwards. So you can't start at every location, because we, why that is, I'll explain in the following slide. But you need to wait for that specific point for those specific points. So you need to first start the replication and then dump. So this is in effect, this is your clone that you still have two keys to. You're going to be reading from this source. <coughs> so you're going to be writing to another database. Yes. It's writing somewhere else. It may be a database that you're trying to control. This is, this is what we need to do to establish that we're starting to read here. Yeah, exactly. And it will tell you from where on it can uh, decode the changes. And since that is a point you can't influence, you provide a snapshot to get the information from there. So how, how do you coordinate what you're doing uh, binary style? At the moment, you to start the same at the moment you don't. Okay. So you need, there's a bit more intelligence needed to do that. Um, it's a possibility. Can you send the recovery point? Yeah. The, Exactly. Like that, so it, it work. yeah, it works. I, I think I, I haven't tried it. I, mean, I have something like it, but it's just a bit too much coordination, and I think we need to start somewhere. But so you can already set the hex ID as a recovery point. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. you need to coordinate uh, the starting of the. Yeah. To m you m make sure that the min recovery point is after that point after that hex ID. So there is right. some complications involved. <laughs> That's the uh, discussion we had uh, on the mailing I mean, list. Yes, I know. <laughs> so um, <laughs> the idea is that you need don't do that. either don't do that yeah. or just you will get an error if you do, and then you can retry. So okay. or just lock lock the uh, lock as before, and yeah. or if you want to do it get really fancy, you can do uh, in the init callback you can do like install an event trigger preventing DDL if you really want to. <laughs> Some of us have um, a lot of different people uh, who will be doing. Uh, our users are kind of like Brownie in motion, which is that anything that could possibly be done will be done. By yeah. Uh, are you yes, sir? <laughs> I just assume that they're all doing a random walk through everything possible you can prompt at the cloak server. <laughs> means that any kind of strategy for success that relies on users not doing things will be very painful for us to insist in the uh, operational world, and we're making a feature really hard for us to provide uh, you know, a strong guarantee. The, well, so, yeah, the event triggers would be I think there. you just need to in install an event trigger preventing yeah. DDL, or you just lock PG class against updates. Or because Does that work? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I tried that. <laughs> Uh, it obviously has some disadvantages because you stop vacuum from working and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> 
which might not be what you want, <laughs> but it works. Um, yeah. But I think in doing the uh, DDL uh, trigger, installing a trigger preventing any changes or just acquiring the locks beforehand. Because you prevent create table. Oh, sure. Okay. We uh, could add that as an option. Yeah, you could. I mean, yeah. I guess you're right. The big problem is it actually prevents creation of new items as well. Yeah, create temp table blocks, which oh, might right. surprise yeah. some yeah. users. Yeah, yeah. I think event triggers are way much more flexible there. So oh. I think that's the way to go for that case. I think that's possible right now. <laughs> OK. Yeah, but you can't yeah. do that after you quite the log yeah. and prevent a DDL. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just DDL. <laughs> okay, so now that the following parts might interest a bit fewer people, but anyway, so how do write ahead log records uh, look like? Um, parts of all you will know. So, for a simple case where we have a single insert, it's like Okay, at a specific position in the right ahead lock, this is the LSN, the address in the right ahead lock, the logical sequence number, which is basically an offset in a file. And we have a transaction number, and we know, okay, it's um, keep being manipulated and it's an insert to a specific relation and a specific point in that relation, and then after that follows data. And the data that follows is basically nearly the same we store in a normal table. So, after fiddling a bit, it looks exactly the same as if you would do a sequential scan or a heap scan in some form, viewed by an index or normally just like that. Again? So there are some problems when you want to do uh, all that decoding from right ahead log because it's not really originally made to uh, produce logical changes because it's just for recovery. So one of the Interesting cases is like, okay, we start several transactions at the same time. Then we create a, sa uh, a save point in one transaction. We insert in the in one transaction a record in another uh, in another session. Then we say, okay, that uh, save point is committed. Insert another row and then commit both tra transactions. The way that will look in, in the right ahead log is, okay, in transaction 704, we started and uh, we did an insert. Then in transaction seven and five, who? That's a separate transaction. We did only a separate save point, but the way it works in Postgres, that's actually a separate transaction. It looks like it somewhere. Uh, so okay, then then uh, we see another one. Oh, I forgot to copy one here. Okay. Uh, then we no, I didn't. So we have now here the. Yeah, I forgot to copy one. Sorry. So you now see the index from here which should be, no, it's all, all right, it's okay. So we see the first commit, which is the S2 commit here. Then we see a commit of S, uh, the 7 and 3, we, and which, and if you look at it, there it tells you, okay, we have several sub-transactions, and uh, a tra sub-transaction that's an XID 7 4. That's the first point where you know, okay, that XID we saw earlier belongs to the top level transaction. So now you need to make sure that you can get all those uh, together in some sensible way. There's also another problem. You might have, uh, at, at this point, you might have a rollback. Sorry, wrong button. You have, might have a rollback here. So, and if the transaction rolled back, you don't want to stream out those changes because they obviously don't persist. And we actually can, but that's another matter. So, what you do is we basically reassemble transactions to the individual items to a full transaction. So we do that by first uh, inside, a if we, we collect all those streams from the first time we see an XID till we see a commit record involving that XID, we 
store those in memory or on disk, we collect them, and then when we see a commit record, like here, we know, okay, we have the XID all rows from 7 and 3, uh, but we also have the ones from 4. So what you do is we do a merge uh, between all those different uh, transactions, which we have either in memory or in disk. And since they are all LSN ordered, we just we don't need to pre-sort them. We can just walk uh, through them using a binary uh, heap merge. And uh, kill them. And when for every change we see, we call uh, a commit uh, the callback from earlier. We had very call the first when you start with the transaction, we call the begin transaction. When you see a change, for every change we call change, and then at the end a commit. No, you can't, because we cannot easily be sure that all the data in there is consistent. And we can, if we see, if the rollback will be in the right headlock. So you might see, if we had done a rollback, you would see a, a transaction thing, but it would say, okay, here's, here's a rollback. And then we say, oh, we see a rollback, we throw away all the changes we accumulated for that transaction and continue on. Yeah, stuff, stuff that gets rolled back never makes it into, never makes it even out to the output plugin. Oh. Exactly, so the output plugin, because we can't actually call output plugins for aborted transactions. Why? We'll come to that in a second. <laughs> yes, so we just throw away that sub X idea. And Is it up to the output plugin to filter on database if you want binary changes? Uh, we, you can only get changes from like one database. Yeah. So you need, because we, to uh, oh, explain, ask me a question in 25 minutes. out the changes when you see the commit record. Yeah, you get the changes streamed in commit order, which is a useful property, which is the order uh, replication solutions like Sloney try to get and use a hack to <laughs> <laughs> not get there fully, yeah. but it's a very useful property for replication. There are other interesting orderings. You might ask Kevin Gritner about that. And I Nobody will be able to follow him. <laughs> <laughs> but there are other orderings, but that's what you can easily do and which is sufficient for most replication scenarios because providing actual serializability across multiple nodes. Which is critical to the crux of this adaptation program. <laughs> <laughs> according, to Kevin, according to Kevin. Right. So no, he said earlier that he don't want to, doesn't want to do that. So, so, so if there's a rollback, it doesn't get sent at all? Yes. You don't even get the output plugin call. Yeah, you don't get the data for any of the any of the getting rolled back. So we actually it's, like it never happened. it's not that hard to add a streaming mode where we stream out the changes and then you get a, could get a rollback also streamed out, but that actually turns out to be very annoying. I, I do think that there's value. It's I have a, a vision of someday being able to scale out Postgres to multiple nodes someday. And being able to, say, parallelize a query across multiple nodes in the middle of a transaction by basically using read replicas to help build your read throughput. So it's, it's possible, it's just that your replication solution needs to get more complicated because it suddenly needs to deal with, with several transactions right. parallel. But oh, no, I, I realize that, and it may not be its first release, but I do think it's important yeah, to get that targeted. It's site. also important for things like if you have a very huge transaction and you stream that at once, it might take a while. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, at some point we might want to say like, okay, the transaction is bigger than 5,000 changes already accumulated, so I switch to streaming mode, tell the output plugin this is a streaming transaction, if it enables that feature, and then stream it out. Yeah. But there's some more changes needed for that because, I don't know, 
I don't know who is interested in that, but you currently the syscache invalidations we need to make the syscache work correctly are only logged on commit, on that, not earlier, and we need them actually earlier. So if oh. that is enabled, we need to make some interesting well, things. One area I can see the lack of things like the rollback during framework is if you start your replica using the binary copy. Why? Because if you start your replica using the binary copy and there's no transaction. But the rollback binary. will won't get. That's, but the rollback roll back, uh, will get rolled back on the new node anyway. If you start it up yeah. the first day, you can't. And if you start any transaction that ha is in progress, will be marked as a rollback. So there's no. Pro you can't unless you count prepared transactions. Uh, you can't have. Oh yeah. <laughs> Believe me. Uh, there's no problem in supporting them in no. the end. No. <laughs> if you want to do that. I didn't oh. care so far. So why are, is this all not that easy? So we, if we do a create table, then we do an insert, and then we do an also table, and then we do an in, another insert. Since we are decoding all that asynchronously, if when we decode the data for that insert, the we need to know how uh, the table looks like to decode. If you go back to the record here, that data here doesn't know anything about the contents. It just knows, OK, I have so, that many columns, but it doesn't know which type the columns have. It doesn't about, know about anything that, like the name. It's just a block of bytes. So you need to know the table definition to do that decoding. So if you decode here, if we are in this point of time, but decode the insert, we would try to decode the one and look at the table. We would see, OK, it's a type text, and try to uh, decode a, a one as a text datum, which will cause a sec fault. Because it will think, oh, there's a toast pointer at the address one. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> so that's not nice. So what we do is, uh, the solution for that is we, while we go through that stream of changes, we have a snapshot of the catalog that, that looks like, OK, uh, when we decode this one here, it looks like, oh, OK, the table definition is we have an a integer and another an integer. When we decode the uh, next uh, <laughs> insert, it looks like, oh, we have a text and uh, the integer. So it really provides a look, uh, the, a snapshot that looks like the catalog at that point in time. So did you use the, when you're doing everything in commit order, do you know what the catalog will say at this commit and at the next commit, and you can figure out what the differences are if you wanted to? Yeah. Could you then win that? If you are able to provide, get it's something useful out of that, sure. But the problem is there might be multiple alters involved in between, and then you don't see that anymore. You, so you need to make a comparison every time the, the CID. Yeah. No, every single oh. insert in there is, might be different. You have, might have an al 10 at, alters at of the, the same. At the commit point, between each commit. The, the, the problem yeah. is that you don't see the, the intermediate stages of the linear space. Consider somebody doing an alt three, three alter tables in a row, and the middle one might be a one yeah, alter table with using. Yeah, For example, alter table using will you won't be able to detect right. that in the catalog. So, doing alter table with catalog differences isn't really going to work. Maybe yeah. <laughs> So how do we build that snapshot continuously? The one, inter one interesting property is we only need the snapshot to be able to look at catalog. We won't be able to look at the normal, heap, normal user tables, because they are not necessary for decoding. There are some edge cases Robert likes to mention. <laughs> but for now, you would need some special things to, to say, this table is also a catalog table. And then it will be decodable. He doesn't like that, but 
that's what I can give you. So when we read the right ahead log, and we do the init rep logical replication, so we establish a logical replication slot, which is this name tag, we read all right ahead log till we see either a shutdown checkpoint or we see a XL running XX record, which has, is built for hot standby and has information about all those transactions are running at the moment. With those informations, we can actually build a snapshot that's sufficient for decoding, uh, looking at the catalog. But we can only do that after all the transactions that are mentioned in there have been fi have finished. So we wait till all the XIDs have committed or aborted. And then at that point, and we don't want to do that all, every time. So every time we evolve it, we write that snapshot to disk because for example, in hot standby, you have the problem that if you shut down a hot standby node and start it up, you might wait, need to wait three minutes till you can access it again if there's a high amount of write traffic on the primary, which isn't really good if you cannot see intermediate changes for replication. Because we, that's obviously a replication solution which uh, skips 10 inserts every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> might not be so useful. So what you do is we save the snapshot every now and then at specific points aligned with uh, specific things in the right ahead log. Every time we see a checkpoint record, every time we see a XL running XX record, we save the current snapshot to disk, which is mostly like half a kilobyte or so. And when we remember when the last time we decoded, uh, we did that was, and so we just start reading from the last time we logged and go on from there. So um, yeah, that's how that works on the very, very high level. That actually is a 2,500 line function, uh, C file, which has quite some complications. That's the most complex part of all this. So this is what we have uh, for change set extraction itself. but since we actually want to build multi-master replication, there are some more features we have in various stages of completion. So for conflict resolution, when you want to implement a last updated wins strategy, it's very useful to know when did a specific XID commit. So we have the commit timestamp uh, module, which can enable. So show commit timestamp. Time when it's enabled, we can do start a transaction. And then when can they get transaction, transaction commit time, 695, and then it will give you the timestamp of that. All crash safe, is, that's very useful for us. And it's, I think I've seen others asking for that kind of thing. It's also useful. Yeah, it's real. Alvaro wrote the code for that in like two hours. So it's just it's not very hard. Then the next thing we have is uh, an abstraction built up on top of sequences because in a multi-master uh, environment using plain sequences is not that easy to use because you need to either you get conflicts on every insert, which is not very nice, or you uh, do stuff like managing the increment on every node individually and saying, okay, you aligning the start value so you never get conflicts between nodes, but that sucks if you add new nodes. So not very nice. So what we want to do is provide another way sequences work. For, and since at the moment sequences are quite hard-coded in Postgres, we added the abstraction for sequences, sequence AM. So just like we have different index access methods, we now have sequence access methods. So we do create extension BDR, which is bidirectional replication, which is our multi-master thing, and say, OK, create a sequence using BDR. So we specify which solution we want to use. It uses, otherwise, it just uses the plain old implementation. And then we tell it, like, can pass options to it, like, OK, we want sequences that acquire a thousand IDs for every node. And when those thousands are used up, gets new ones, but that's just our implementation. You can do lots of other things. You can do, you can implement gapless sequences if you really want to. I don't, but some people seem to want to. Yeah, 
So at the moment, they are not transactional. So if you ne really need them, you can say, OK, create sequence using uh, gapless sequence. And then it would obviously involve more locking, but you could do it. Postgres license. It's on git.postgres.org the live translator. So, and what we really want to do is the multi-master with conflict resolution implementation. That's why we are funded to work on the whole change set extraction thingy. So, what you're building is logical replication. We want asynchronous multi-master because our use case is globally distributed nodes and doing synchronous globally distributed multi-master. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, somebody else. I, my life is hard enough. So, and for now, we implement a last update win strategy because that's good enough for us. But uh, uh, the next thing would be to allow specific conflict handlers to be called on every conflict, and then to make sure we have a consistent state, we lock the after the after image, and make sure it resolves the same way on all nodes. So, eventual consistency. Yeah. What other possible? Yeah. Is it possible to get that difference from you the need, logical world? Yes, you need to set a flag to do that. So because it involves more data being yeah. collected. But yes. If, well, uh, I think we it's possible that we can get the change set extraction into the next release. There are some people interested in that. I think we might be able to get uh, the sequence stuff in, possibly even the uh, commit timestamp. There's some problems around why that might be problematic. But uh, the rest of the multi-master thing doesn't actually need to modify any core routines in the way we have it now. So we just distribute it as an independent tool for now. And when it well, seems it apparent that So we just have like our own routines that do the heap insert, heap lock, and on a low level, and yeah. yeah. About the same as in any normal Postgres. You need to have. No, you can't do that in Postgres. So. No, you can't have more than one gigabyte per column. You can't have more than one gigabyte per column at the moment. Oh, okay. And that needs to fit into memory. So, and if you have 10 of those, it needs to fit at the moment. Usually it has to fit for Yeah, for, <laughs> for us it has only to fit there once. So <laughs> we might actually be better <laughs> off than normal Postgres. Uh, testing? <laughs> uh, the code, there are some areas of the code which aren't up to, up to something I want to use in production. Is this referring to the No. So there will be some months to use the that in production. Also, it, at the moment, it depends on patches in Postgres that aren't core. So you need to run a patched Postgres. And I'm not sure you want to do that in product. So, not yet. What, what do you think is possible? I'm just thinking down the road to the normal time to get it. <laughs> do you want to say something about the time frame? Or? I, I was just wondering um, when the new feature that you're developing is going to perfectly solve all of my problems in every situation. So, <la> and if it isn't going to do that, why not? <laughs> <laughs> Because I didn't have a life for one year, <laughs> not for five. We hope that the change, 
we on the developer meeting yesterday. We hope that we can get a patch ready very, hopefully very early on, because patches early getting committed uh, in at the end of nine F releases tend to be problematic and tends to involve in emotions to a degree <laughs> <laughs> that aren't comfortable. So. Uh, it won't get into 9.3, and it wasn't ready at all for 9.3, and I hate it that it isn't in 9.3, but it's the right decision, so. That's great. And it's, I think, like many of the decisions, it probably went to Yeah, definitely. There's no way to know until it's done, you know, exactly how much all the things Yes. So, for example, I had the first draft of that presented at P last PGCon, and since then, I don't think too many lines of that code remain. <laughs> <laughs> I think mostly comments. <laughs> <laughs> no, they changed. No, absolutely not. You, you can do that because you, and you probably want to do that for many use cases. But you get past the relation which contains the relation name, you get and can do any additional syscache lookups, catalog lookups, and if you declare your configuration tables as time, being type terrible, you have even those. You can declare Skype, uh, uh, Skype tools or uh, Londista or uh, Sloany table as, okay, I can look at that in the output plugin, let me see, okay, at that point of time, we do decide to ship that and or not. So the, the plugin has a way of looking at the database yes. at that time? Yes. What is, with the only, f only for catalog tables or ca tables you declare <laughs> as being cataloged. Did you already have some performance Yes, we are about uh, three times faster than Lundist, uh, PGQ and Lundist, just streaming out the changes. I, I, I didn't do the uh, other comparison <laughs> so far, and yes. So, and I have cases where the performance gap, if you have like one timestamp column and you do binary output in the output plugin, it's like uh, 15 times faster. Just because the output uh, functions for timestamp are very expensive, if you do like post gist, it's the same. As soon as you go to stream out binary changes, it gets much faster. Have you had a chance to measure the performance impact on the, on the uh, originating node? Yes, I have. It depends a bit. Uh, at the mo at the first, it was in fact quite a bit, but at the moment it's like three to five percent. When you have one active and the increase in the uh, amount of data in the writer headlock during a PG bench run is like a 6%. So, I'm just going to ask the same question that Jan just asked. I just want to make sure that I actually heard it right. You can do in the output plugin syscache lookups and then yes. you get what it looks like at the commit time? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you do need to do that because otherwise you can't call output functions. And because, for example, if you call record out, do you know what it does? It does a syscache yeah, lookup. Right, so there's no way to do it without syscache. Wow. I, I think we may have missed something. It's not a commit time. It's a at the time. If it's a commit time, then that then the, the data is right that before commit. Right. No, no. The snapshot will be like exact every time you're in a change, you get past the right. snapshot that is consistent with one that would have been you had like when you created. Except that those at creation time are actual snapshot now. So you have, so you have possibly well, yeah. more inconsistency there than at the current point in time. But Robert is going actually, to fix that. Actually, it seems like you actually might have an improvement in efficiency when you're using serialized lookups or repeatable leaks. Repeatable, you in, have fewer snapshots being transmitted. No, there aren't any transmitted, snapshots transmitted. You compute oh, them on the it's fly. Squirting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That was okay. one of the very hard requirements from various people that we. Yeah, yeah. certain people that. 
<laughs> yeah, you need to see the holes in my wall. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I agree, totally. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I am very happy. I just wasn't happy back then. <laughs> but that's the nature of being told what you did is wrong. <laughs> uh, so, any other questions? Yes. There's a system view where you can say, OK, which uh, logical application plots haven't been streamed for a long time, and you need to include that in your monitoring setup, just like you do need to do the same for uh, stream replicas using uh, host standby feedback. Or if you, you need to do to monitor long-running transactions, you need to monitor prepared uh, transactions, all that. No, it uses the normal catalog, and because we are in an MVCC database, we don't immediately delete data. So what is the vacuum, vacuum exactly? We prevent vacuum from removing those rows on the catalog tables. Not on normal tables, but on catalog tables. So we can so still. Just, if you have J replicas that fall behind a lot, you can see some catalog here. Yes. Yes. For example, if you do like a massive create temporary table load, that is going to be noticeable. I hope we can get changed that extraction. I hope we can have a chance for getting in the commit timestamps and the sequences, because those are the parts that any of those solutions will need to work without being tied to the core release cycle, because at the moment, all that is moving too fast for core, in my opinion. So those are the ones I want to be able to get. And there are some smaller technical patches that aren't appropriate to discuss here. I, because you're sitting in the middle. <laughs> because you're in the middle and you're standing. You're the only one standing up. <laughs> I'll say that isn't just me. <laughs> so, uh, one more thing. There are quite many people I have to thank for. So, many thanks to all mentioned and to all people I didn't mention because I didn't feel like discuss, uh, going through several hundreds of emails. I think it's way over a thousand left holder. So, and by now, Peter isn't at second quarter anymore, but still, he has helped and he possibly will help further. So, definitely deserve to mention. To mention. So, 